you can help fight COVID-19. The pandemic felt so overwhelming. Staying at home wasn't enough. The novel coronavirus has humbled every nation and every individual. But it doesn't have to be like that. Maybe if you could, you know, gather all the computers in the world and, and put them to work. And to be able to do things that you could not do by any other means. With your help, we can. The Folding at Home project does exactly that. Folding at Home is using its distributed computing model to create the most powerful supercomputer on Earth. The collective power of millions of volunteers to aid COVID-19 research efforts. In a grassroots example. Your rig is helping researchers find treatments and vaccines faster. We're passionate about this effort and the impact it is having. We need people like you. Working together can make such a big difference. You can learn more at foldingathome.org. In response to uh, a lot of the questions we've had from folks uh, throughout our time at Folding at Home and, and then the platform and social media is, you know, what is a work unit doing? And what, uh, what is actually happening when you run a work unit? And, and, uh, and so, you know, our, our speakers in the previous segment already, hint, uh, already discussed a lot of these details and I wanted to provide some more concrete uh, visual examples as to, as to what actually uh, is going on when you run a work unit. So this is, uh, this is a, in, in a quick introduction to molecular dynamics or what does folding at home actually do? So, you know, from the, from the million foot high up level, uh, you know, it's, it's important to note that folding at home, we're simulating protein dynamics and proteins are everywhere in the cell and uh, can be found in throughout the place. And, and you know, from, from your high school courses, you know, we can discuss the, the central dogma, which is you have your genome, which is your DNA inside of your nucleus. And this DNA is the blueprint from which all these proteins are encoded. This is converted into RNA, which acts as a messenger and is translated at the ribosomes that have circled in green uh, into proteins. And these proteins can then be are distributed throughout the cell to, and act as the machines and the workhorses uh, of, of these cells. And, you know, and, they're, and they're very small relative to, this, to the cell. I mean, if I zoom in on just a single chunk of this membrane, this isn't even to scale. There may be you know, millions of proteins within a small cross-section of just the cellular membrane. And, and, real, and really, there's, they're, they're distributed uh, ubiquitously throughout, throughout our bodies and throughout life uh, and, and, uh, and wherever function is needed. But it's important to note, and, and uh, Dr. Bowman mentioned this, is that these proteins are still following the same laws of physics and chemistry uh, universally. And so, so and, you know, and these proteins are all made up of atoms. And so here's a, here's a single protein as an example, and each sphere here is, is made up of atoms. And uh, you can make, you know, these, atom, these atoms have, have specific arrangements and, and the protein is folded in a certain shape and form. And this form implies a certain degree of function. There's a, there's a phrase called the structure of function paradigm. Uh, but it's, it's really difficult to just make sense of it alone, but we can learn a lot already from the chemical interactions and the chemistry going on from the atomic arrangements. However, this picture becomes complicated very quickly when we start considering the atomic arrangements of cells. Uh, if I zoomed out back into our cellular membrane picture, uh, this, uh, the, the, a membrane can look very complicated just for you know, a very simple thing such as detecting a hormone. So, so or detecting, so on the left is, a, is this growth factor receptor and there's this whole cascade of proteins that I'm showing here and, and, and trying to highlight, you know, as close as I can from a zoomed out perspective, uh, all the, as many atoms as you can see. And all of this is just involved in, you know, maybe one signaling pathway. Uh, when, and, and understanding this, you know, you can learn a lot just from the static picture about who might interact with who and, and in, in conjunction with biochemical experiments can learn a lot about uh, how these things might uh, interact with one another. But these pictures are still static and are limited in scope and, and you can only learn so much from them. And so appreciating their, their dynamics is in fact very important. So. You know, this is a really complicated picture. So, so let's say instead we talk about a more arbitrary, simplified biological system. And in this case, her name is Coco. 
So if we wanted to understand Coco's behavior, we can learn a lot about her from this picture. She's got a head, she's got four legs, she's got a tail. She looks pretty happy. Uh, however, this isn't the only shape Coco can exist in. In fact, she exists as a, as a croissant sometimes and is more folded up here instead of the extended conformation on the left. And these conformations that are alternative to one another may only be achievable in specific conditions or upon certain inputs. And, and this is how uh, you know, certain proteins may function inside of, our, inside of our cell to turn on and off in response to a hormone or response to, to light hitting our eyes or when we hear things. And so to appreciate the behavior of Coco in a more a complete detail, we need to actually watch movies of her. And when we do, we can learn a lot about her high probability motion, such as the fact that she might like to lick my face multiple times a day. Uh, and this is in fact a daily occurrence, but these appreciating her dynamics and her movements is how we will learn a lot more about her biological behaviors. And much in the same way, if we want to learn a lot about our protein that I showed earlier, where every sphere is an atom, uh, we need to be able to watch it move. And we need to be able to watch, uh, watch the simulations happen and the atoms move around uh, over time. And, and from these shape changes, we can learn a lot. Uh, so, so you know, where, how, how do these simulations run? And, and it's important to note that these simulations are in fact what constitute a, a work unit of folding at home. And so, so these simulations are run in iterative steps where uh, in a simplified view, we start off with some initial set of atoms that set, like the starting picture that I showed. And from those uh, initial positions and maybe some velocities that we assign them, we compute the energy uh, along, uh, to compute the force. So we, we use these energy functions that John briefly mentioned as well to compute the force on every atom. And from here, we, we integrate using Newton's equations of motion. So, so just watching, you know, applying F equals MA for those physicists of you out there and then updating. So we just move the atoms according to the Newton's laws of motion and save that update. And we just do that over and over again. And this represents, you know, this, this loop is just how we compute a single frame of this MD simulation. And, you know, running a certain number of, of this loop will generate a single work unit. And, you know, we, we are trying to consider other things. We oftentimes consider uh, a variety of different conditions and a variety of different, uh, different uh, uh, life, li you know, try to mimic the conditions of reality as close as possible. So we have to consider temperature and pressure and salt. But in the end, what we're, we're, we're trying to, to do is we're trying to generate these, these molecular dynamic simulations. And like, uh, like Vijay mentioned, it takes a lot of these, these steps, these integration steps to collect enough data of these molecular dynamics and these atomic motions to uh, learn about protein behaviors. And, and that's where, you know, we, where it's possible thanks to you folks. And so this is, and so this is where folding at home uh, power comes in is we, we have, you know, many of you are familiar with these assignment servers and the work servers where all of our files are stored. And you folks out there in the world are, are the client, are running the client software. And we start off with a series of work units. And these work units uh, are, are you know, we optimize and we test beforehand. So any of you beta testers out there, you help us generate these initial work units and make sure our points are optimized. And what then happens is a work unit is sent out to a client, it's run and it's returned. And that work unit is then subsequently used to generate the next uh, sequence, uh, the next work, the, the subsequent work unit. So if, you, if you've noticed, you know, there's uh, many, many projects are assigned a PRCG, project run clone gen. Uh, the run, these could be any number of runs and clones, but in the left work unit here is gen zero and the right is gen one. So gens are always uh, consecutively generated in time as clients run them. And so over time we'll generate run multiple work units until eventually we stitch them together to generate these movies as a whole. Uh, and so, and, and once we have these movies, we can start making sense of them using, using network models and a variety of different approaches that we've talked about before. But this uh, allows us to study proteins at a much larger scale, scale than before. And 